So the project team, um, we, uh, we kind of divided up the work. We found that to be more effective. So we have our database administrators. We, have, we use two database administrators. They have other responsibilities, but we found uh, that in our project implementation, um, especially when we're doing the monthly releases, and even now with the uh, with our 796 upgrade, one of them might focus more on production while the other one's focusing on the project work. Uh, we have uh, two uh, ETL developers. We have a third uh, in the wings. Um, we actually have, uh, from our major functional areas, we have what we call functional liaisons. They also reach back into their organizations um, to develop dashboards. Almost all the dashboards are developed in the functional areas and not developed by the IT uh, organization. That's really key to us. Um, you can see the BI. We have uh, uh, Brent, in addition to Brent, uh, helping me uh, facilitate uh, resources. We have three, uh, three key uh, players. Um, it was uh, Charles really provided the, uh, the continuity over the, the duration of the project. Um, Sunil is now helping us with the uh, with the 796 uh, conversion. Uh, Catherine came in and helped us uh, with a lot of fit gap analysis. One of the things that um, that we learned again because our model was uh, we wanted to have this knowledge transfer. Um, is that uh, they can really produce product, and, and, and I guess I would call it product in whatever phase you want to call it, fast. And so we actually um, uh, had to, to resource load and, and, and reduce their involvement a little bit because they were just way ahead of us. Um, and it's not really their traditional model. And I think, Brent, if you want to talk a little bit about how uh, BICG usually staffs projects, I think that will probably be uh, useful for you. Primarily is, is a BI designer. Um, that's a person who uh, is really in charge of all things dashboard and report development. Um, that person typically also facilitates a part-time project management role. That would be one resource. Uh, the second resource would be you know, the, the, the typical solution architect who is really fun, uh, fundamentally responsible for the overall architecture uh, and deployment of the, of the solution. Um, and lastly would be a, what we call an ETL lead, so that, that person is really responsible um, soup to nuts uh, with regard to the, the overall ETL process, including the fit gap analysis and also uh, actually filling those gaps uh, with, with the, the development uh, as well as the testing of the ETL uh, mapping. So, you know, two and a half to three people uh, typically is what, what we're staffing on these projects. Um, Time frame, depending on the complexity, you know, if you're looking at a, you know, a fairly standard out of the box Oracle EBS uh, type of back office ERP system, um, those those implementations can take, uh, you know, as uh, 12 weeks, 12 to 16 weeks are our typical time frames that we see to actually deploy uh, uh, some of these BI applications. So I mentioned that we had multiple data sources. That was a real challenge for us. Um, I don't know, uh, uh, Brent mentioned the, the vanilla uh, e-business suite uh, deployment. Uh, it may be that federal facilities don't know vanilla, you know, although we've heard that it is a flavor. By gosh, you know, tutti frutti all the way is what we say. We had a fair amount of ETL mapping modification. Again, one of the, the uh, pieces of wisdom uh, that we leveraged from BICG was uh, where it would make sense for us to do uh, ETL mappings, um, almost like on a make-buy basis. What, what, what would pay dividends, what wouldn't? Uh, what would we see that would be uh, sustained over the long term as far as uh, a custom methodology or custom mappings? I mentioned before that we have a significant in, uh, investment in, in Oracle. Uh, we have a number of their uh, eBusiness Suite products. Uh, we're actually preparing to go through the 11i10 uh, to 12.1 uh, to release process. We're going to be doing process re-engineering at the same time so that we can hopefully eliminate more of our customizations, get rid of the IBM uh, mainframe, get rid of some of these uh, uh, custom applications that we developed for our business requirements uh, as, we've, as we've matured. It is, it is a challenge for us. It is uh, a challenge for the laboratory. You know, when you don't have information, you don't have data quality issues. So it never really was apparent until, the, again, the procurement division leader said, uh, um, 
why are all these procurements showing uh, un unspecified source as opposed to saying it was a small business or what have you like that? He says, my God, you know, 50% of my procurements are unspecified. How could that be? And the initial criticism came to the BI tool. Well, you know, we didn't decide that these were unspecified. We said, you know, it's your transactional system. And let's drill down and let's find that record and then you can see who the procurement rep is that, that coded it unspecified and you can have a conversation with them or their management as to uh, uh, that data practice. Uh, one of the current themes we see when you're implementing business intelligence systems for the first time is that it tends to put a spotlight on uh, data issues and process issues that you have within your organization. Um, and this is a good thing, um, but historically, when people were using Excel spreadsheets and, and those uh, older types of technologies, they could easily hide that. They could go into a spreadsheet and modify it. Whereas when you're dealing with a business intelligence application, you don't have that back door to go in and, and, and clean up your data uh, at the last minute. You have to, you have to institute uh, some rigor and discipline around your master data management practice. Um, so some of the results, of course, uh, providing intelligence is really key. Um, we, for the first time, actually had insights to guide the procurement process. So we were actually able now to go through and, and, and tactically uh, uh, almost preempt uh, issues that uh, management might have you know, by warning them that, uh, that we've got a, a circumstance that we weren't aware of or that we're working this priority or that priority. Having a single source of truth, source of truth is very important. Uh, you know, if you're if you're using heroics to produce reports, uh, you can have two heroes come up with two different answers, and that's a real problem. Um, and so uh, we've moved away from that. Uh, institutional confidence is really important. Again, through coming through the business suite uh, portal, uh, it's showing that we really have an integrated process as opposed to having this. Uh, a funky old data warehouse thing that uh, you wouldn't know if you were looking at, at uh, burdened or unburdened dollars. I don't know if any of you are federal facilities, but that's a big deal in, in, in projects. The uh, online access and the drill down, um, we knew it, I mean, I knew it when I saw it the first time, but it's, uh, it's, it's big time eye candy for senior managers to go right to a transactional record. It's huge. Um, so when I see that, that's when I commit the staff or overcommit the staff because it's like it's so cool. You've got to get more of that out there. Um, one of the things that, um, as far as the implementation goes, that, that we discovered also is that um, sort of like a, the Venn diagram that once you stand up your procure and spend analytics, you've got a third of what you need for the human resources operations. Once you've stood up human resources operations and uh, 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 procure and spend, you're really close to finishing accounts payable. Our vision is that once we uh, flesh those out a little bit more, we'll be very, very close to project analytics. We're real excited about the role-based security as we push more and more product out to the line. Uh, we're hoping by the end of this year we're going to actually have a dashboard on every manager's desk. Uh, the executive sponsorship and then the executive use of the tool, I think it's a, uh, it may be a, a one of the significant reoccurring themes that I hear from people who have business intelligence is that the early adapters are the executives. It's not the, the line staff or the line managers. Um, and so uh, it works that the executive is so, so jazzed by this that um, in this case in a procurement, uh, the, the division leader would, uh, through using some of the tools, he would create snapshots uh, send them down to his line manager, and the line manager was like, where did you get this? Even though they had all been trained and the, had the tool available to them, they were just not used to using that as a management tool.